Hello there, I'm Tamina Kauji, an independent broadcast journalist, and this is my personal talk show, The Point, um, where I discuss the most pressing issues in the news cycle, speaking to subject matter experts, each with a tangible impact in their chosen arena. Now, on today's episode, my focus is on the malignant force that is disinformation, or as politicians like to refer to it as, fake news. Um, now, within the context of the COVID-19 outbreak, just the sheer volume and the virality of disinformation is absolutely unprecedented. The problem being, of course, that during a crisis such as the current pandemic, online falsehoods can directly result in offline harm. Um, false cures, false claims, lives endangered, meaning lives can also be lost, and all-round confusion. So, yet, as we look at governance to guide us through this crisis, journalism and media freedom is also coming under threat as unfavorable or critical perspectives of governments are swiftly followed by accusations of false news and sometimes followed by unwarranted persecution or targeting of the media. So, is the coronavirus the wake-up call needed for journalism and media freedom in East Asia? Or... Will it further entrench state protectionism and mistrust of the media? That is the bigger question I have for my panelists today. Now, bringing in first up, Zarar Kuro, who is joining us from Karachi in Pakistan. Um, Zarar is a current affairs commentator and analyst with Dawn News TV with a special interest in disinformation. We also have Zurairi A.R., assistant news editor and columnist with Malay Mail, coming to us live from Kuala Lumpur. Hey, Zarairi. Hi. Aisha Llewellyn, acting editor-in-chief with New Narrative, joins us from Medan, Sumatra. And Ross Tapsell, Hello. author, researcher, and senior lecturer at College of Asia and the Pacific, at the Australian National University will be joining us from Sydney. All right, everyone. How are all of you so far? <laughs> okay, alive. All. Yeah, alive, yes. So thank you all for making the time. We'll tap in Ross in just a little bit from Sydney. Uh, lovely to have you all on screen. Um, how's everyone doing so far under varying levels of lockdown. Well, so far still surviving, I mean, <laughs> and I count that as a privilege. Yeah, almost a month here for us in Malaysia. I'm also broadcasting from Kuala Lumpur. There are almost a, exactly a month for you all in Pakistan, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, I, I think that there's an increased sense of uh, freedom, you know, with like uh, perhaps like a dash of panic. Uh, but I, I, I think largely we're coming around um, to the belief that, you know, what will be, will be. And uh, we're mostly holding out hope that, uh, you know, uh, the heat does have an effect, although I personally doubt it. <laughs> and that eventually, you know, somebody's going to come up, somebody's going to come up with a vaccine. And in the that's meantime, right. you do have people gargling with garlic. And uh, I'm not entirely sure if that's going to help. But, you know, whatever floats your boat. That's right. That's right. Um, Aisha, how many days has it been in so far, at least where you are right now in Medan? Well, um, Indonesia uh, declared its first cases on the 2nd of March, but we have resisted or the government has resisted uh, a lockdown here, um, especially in Medan, where I am in North Sumatra. It's, it's not exactly business as usual, but pretty much um we don't we're not really under many restrictions here so uh you know on a personal level we have a lot of freedom but that's obviously not necessarily a good thing right okay so ross is in the background as well um can we tap him in now hello ross how are you hello everyone thank you for joining us ross all right brilliant ross so i was just done doing the round asking the others, Zarar in Pakistan, Zurairi in Malaysia with me, and Aisha in Medan, how things are so far in the lockdown. Um, so moving into you, how are things under lockdown in Australia? 
it's been 20 odd days hasn't it yeah and, and in a way we're we're quite privileged we've um we've been lucky we 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 did mm -hmm. start a lockdown just in time i think we we just made it um and the cases have dropped uh, rapidly over the past uh, few weeks since the lockdown. So uh, it was close. For a while there, we were looking at a scenario like Italy and um, and we were expecting the worst and, and preparing for, for that kind of scenario. And then the, the lockdown seems to have worked just in time. And now we're looking at one of the one of the best places in the world uh, at the moment. But, you know, as we've seen with Singapore and Japan, things can change. Um, but yeah, uh, in, in, in the end, it's, it's going quite well. Right. Okay. So more on how your perspectives as a researcher, as an author can contribute to the East Asia perspective in just a little, but let's get the balls rolling with, um, Zarar. So Zarar, I wanted to ask you, uh, Pakistan, 204 million population, the good, the bad, the ugly, what's the situation really been like with regards to COVID-19, um, on the ground. Um, the show that you host, uh, Zara Hatke, it also focuses on disinformation primarily. How has that ramped up during this period of COVID-19 in Pakistan? Yeah, um, uh, well, um, I mean, first, let me just start out with like a little yeah. piece of good oh, news. Okay. And uh, that, that is that uh, in the United Kingdom, yeah, yeah, good news, good news. But just wait for it, because uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, what's happened is that I just saw that British Telecom just released an appeal for people to stop attacking telecom workers and to stop G towers. That's right. And that's because uh, of the conspiracy theory that it is in fact five G that spreads the coronavirus. So, um, you know, because we have sort of. Uh, go-to response, right, in our part of the world, uh, you know, I think Asia is ready, you would be able to relate to this, that, you know, oh my God, I mean, uh, look, at least the Goras aren't doing it, but here you have the Goras attacking, so it, us local, it makes me feel a little bit better about the you know, misinformation we're facing in Pakistan, which I'm glad to say now that I think that the tide of misinformation is mm -hmm. receding a little bit. Um, there were basically two main types uh, of misinformation regarding uh, COVID-19. Um, and Ipsos recently just did a very good survey uh, about the kind of misinformation floating in Pakistan. So there's religious misinformation and then there's scientific misinformation. Mm -hmm. The religious misinformation you can pretty much imagine is that, you know, oh, you know, uh, if God doesn't will it, we won't get or, you know, if we say our prayers and our faith is strong, we're not the virus. Obviously, that's not the case. You've had prayer leaders getting, getting dying at the world. That, um, for example, the virus lives in your nostrils for three days. So if you were to stick a blow dryer and put it on high heat. Oh, and my shove God. That I, on, I remember uh, that. Uh, you post. tweeted about this. Oh, <laughs> it was. You know, that's what, I know. I mean, what, on, on one hand. You 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 may have a funny bone to pick by it. Um, yeah. Video. But... Yeah. Uh, but but here it gets better because um, there was this video by this uh, doctor somewhere in Saudi Arabia, a doctor of Pakistani origin, and he's explaining to people the correct way to stick a blow dryer up your nose, right? Because apparently there's a right in sticking a blow dryer up your nose. Um, he. We took that video and we sort of debunked it. And he actually called in on the show to complain that we were being rude to him, you know. My word. And that, in fact, like uh, sticking a blow dryer up your nose is uh, to kill the virus. So that that happened, you know. Um, beyond that, I think it's pretty much run of the mill. I think it's the same kind of disinformation that's mm -hmm. floating around the world. Um, it is getting bunked. I think that uh, the government has done a good job of getting the message out belatedly. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are doing it. And I think that overall, I think that the local media has behaved with a high degree of responsibility when it comes to countering this. Right. But really, that blow dryer story, it's way up there. Uh, we've got a couple from Malaysia as well, but more on that later. Uh, yeah, moving that's into, yeah, moving into Ross now. Uh, Ross, almost a year ago um, in the New York Times, you wrote, um, quote unquote, as much as Indonesia's politicians have been warning the people about disinformation, it is largely they and their teams who are producing fake news. Now, regarding media in Indonesia, what are some of your observations since the COVID-19 pandemic came into public consciousness there? Is the landscape 
different now from what you described also in your book, Media Power in Indonesia and in the New York Times op-ed? Yeah, so, I mean, of, of course, a, a lot of what I was writing about then was around uh, political campaigning, around disinformation uh, during That's election right. times, in, including in the, in the New York Times there. Um, of course, one of the points that the books make, it, that the book makes is around uh, the, the changing nature of platforms and, and the way in which social media in the convergence era has changed the way in which people engage with information. Yeah. So as we know in Malaysia as well, um, also in Indonesia, we're seeing a rise in the, in, in the way in which citizens um, share information and receive information and the trust that they place in those sources. And, uh, you know, we, we know WhatsApp has, um, has become a really dominant platform as well as Facebook uh, for the way in which people uh, receive and believe in information. And that's been the case for quite some time, particularly around health uh, misinformation mm -hmm. uh, and health information. And um, so, yes, of course, when we see a, a pandemic, which is essentially a, a, round, a basically um, Need, we need quality health information. It's no surprise that we are seeing um, a, a trend in which people are not sure what information to believe and what and, and what information to trust. And that comes down to trust in government ability and also in the media, mainstream media. That's right. Um, from there, moving on to um, Aisha. Now, the COVID-19 scenario in Indonesia, what do you feel? Feel will happen in Indonesia considering that it is middle of April and only five days into a partial lockdown in Jakarta. What do you feel the pandemic has laid quite bare when it comes to governance and public confidence towards institutions? I think to add to uh, what Dr. Ross was saying is that what's been really uh, interesting this time around is that a lot of the uh, information that we've had um, has come from the government that has kind of led people astray. So often you see this uh, in Indonesia coming through, uh, as Dr. Ross said, Facebook and WhatsApp. This time it's come directly from the government. So we've had uh, the health minister, Tarawan, for example, said that uh, if everyone just kept praying, that uh, it would be fine. Uh, Maruf Amin, the uh, deputy uh, president, also said the same thing. We had um, Luhut Panjaitan saying that because it's so hot here, that we'll all be spared from the virus. So all of these kind of... Uh, hoaxes, as it were, have been coming straight from the top government officials. And even President Jokowi was handing out jamu, which is kind of a medicinal drink with mm -hmm. turmeric in it and ginger, which is supposed to also help with the virus, it, like was handing that out to people who had recovered. So it's really, you know, you can't blame people here for being confused and for thinking that things like turmeric are going to help when it's really coming from the highest levels of government at this point. Yeah, speaking about the highest levels of government, I've, uh, I'll go into that with Zurairi deeper in just a while. But Zurairi, and now Malaysia is also in the unique global situation of having undergone a political coup in late February, right when the COVID-19 situation was beginning to intensify. So that left us in Malaysia with roughly 14 days, two entire weeks that passed before the installation of the Perikatan National Government. Now, what are your observations uh, insofar on the government communication channels? How have they fared considering that there was a complete coup and a turnover in the midst of it all, COVID-19 wise? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways from Malaysia, which is it is a very bad idea to change the government during a public health emergency. <laughs> but or perhaps uh, the perfect th time. <laughs> yeah, depending on who you look it from. But I guess uh, the silver lining is here. It's, it's proof that the civil service uh, can still move on even uh, without the executive. So uh, we've seen uh, the uh, director general of our Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Nohisham Abdullah, uh, has now becoming uh, the appointment of the government uh, addressing uh, the public on the issue. So in, in, instead of uh, having a public face from within the government, uh, which 
uh, is politically questionable on how how you look at it on how they uh, came into power but by having a civil servant as a public point man uh, has been a very good decision and uh, because uh, he comes from the medical and scientific background and that also helps with the kind of messaging that the public is getting when it comes to uh, tackling the crisis um, and i think uh, as for how the government itself uh, is handling uh, the communications with the public, I think we have seen uh, a bigger usage of uh, government uh, government uh, tools, you know, to uh, spread this information. For example, uh, we have a, a website called sebenarnya.my, uh, which translates into well, actually, <laughs> uh, which uh, yeah, has actuality. been yeah has been around uh, to sort of like explain the government's position and we have seen uh, this uh, explanation uh, or debunking of hoaxes and fake news uh, going around uh, for the for the past uh, few weeks and we have also uh, one one thing that has been uh, done much better uh, by this government compared to the Pakatan Harapan government is the use of a quick response team under the communications uh, ministry to sort of address all these um, hoaxes and uh, questionable news uh, that has been going around. So uh, this quick response team would have a Twitter account and they would release uh, daily updates on uh, the kind of uh, issues that are being questioned by the public and they explain what's happening. Of course, there is also a con uh, behind uh, this move, which is the, the kind of uh, issues that they are uh addressing you know uh what, what sort of issues should be um addressed by the quick response team and what sort of issues shouldn't and i think that, that the third way was uh, having the national security council uh, actually blasting messages uh, through sms and also having uh, their own uh, mm -hmm. telegram group uh, for, for people who to subscribe and get up-to-date information but as uh, we have seen uh, the third approach is currently the worst uh, managed uh, of all the three because first uh, in the telegram group uh, it, it has uh, it, 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 uh, the national security council has been giving out too many information uh, that sometimes you know it becomes such a noise to to discern which are the most important points and which are just you know advertisement or propaganda and the same goes uh, with sms i have heard people actually complaining that they have get they are they are getting too many text messages from the security council that they think uh, are just not that important and you know it, it, it has the danger of people uh, just it becomes uh, noise ignoring. exactly yes that's right Right. So I, I, I love that you made the point about yes. the civil service and the importance of it uh, for the COVID-19 reaction in Malaysia. Completely agree with that. Um, your thoughts on the fact that um, while the civil service, particularly the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, is doing a fantastic job with the director general really stepping up. But on the other hand, there is the incident of um, the health, the new health minister himself having made a claim that um, drinking warm water will actually prevent the COVID-19 uh, virus, will kill the virus, but that was not officially debunked by the ministry, by the National Security Council. How damaging is it when that happens? After all the good work that's also been happening <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, I think um, we saw that the effect immediately when, uh, I think for a couple of days, uh, when uh, our health minister, Dr. Adham Babu, uh, was appointed, he became the point man in the press uh, briefings, the daily press briefings. But soon after that, uh, you immediately do not see him anymore uh, as a point man, but instead we see the uh, health uh, ministry director general. And I think that speaks a lot to how uh, this has been very damaging to his uh, image. And it's not just him. Uh, we have seen uh, many instances where the health director general uh, politely, but also scientifically debunk a lot of actions and decisions that have been taken by the government. For example, uh, he has uh, blasted uh, one of the ministers for uh, this uh, for disinfection exercises where they spray water onto the roads. Uh, mm -hmm. And just um, yesterday, I think, uh, no, just, just now, um, he had to explain that, you know, there is no need for any disinfection chambers because uh, the education, higher education uh, ministries has been uh, pushing uh, public universities to come up with those, these sort of ideas. So I think there have been many cases where you see this sort of, um, you know, contrary uh, opinions or views coming from uh, the health ministry and also the rest of the government. Uh, and it, it, it has sort of uh, shaken the trust and how people view the current government.
That's right. Now, thanks for that, Zerari. Moving back into Zarar. Um, Zarar, now considering, of course, um, the size, the breadth of Pakistan, you had some comments to share about how um, provinces and the federation are coming into um, broad, um, a lot, a lot of um, conflict over how to deal with COVID-19 lockdowns. And tell me about your concerns, particularly in light of the holy month of Ramadan, as well as Eid or Hari Raya, as we call it here in Indonesia and Malaysia, which will also, it, it's hot on our heels. Ramadan basically begins um, within the next week itself. Well, um, with Ramzan, I mean, um, it might actually in one way be a blessing in disguise because uh, economic and social activity does do sort of slow down. You know, it's hot, people are fasting, nobody really likes to move around too much. But um, on the other hand, you know, you do have the nightly uh, prayer gatherings, the Tarawis. So there you're going to have an issue. I mean, you've had scattered issues every Friday um, in certain mosques. I mean, by and large, the restrictions are being observed. But you know how it is. Um, as time goes on, these things become harder and harder to implement, especially if people see a overall relaxation in the lockdown. And uh, we are moving in that direction. We are seeing uh, certain businesses allowed to operate under certain SOPs. But again, you know, Tamina, I mean, as you know very well, the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, Absolutely. how are you going to implement? How are you going to implement those SOPs? You cannot station. Um, there, there isn't enough police to go around. There uh, aren't. There isn't enough civil service officers to go around. Um, so we are going to, I think, see an uptick in uh, infection uh, up very soon. Um, I just wanted to add something that Zuleri was sure. saying. I mean, unfortunately, we have also had. Um, some misinformation coming from the top. Um, luckily, nothing as bad as what I've heard from you guys so far. I mean, but oh, uh, really? we had very hard to Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, feeling little, I'm feeling a little better um, after hearing you guys. I'm, I'm feeling bad <laughs> for you, but I'm, I'm feeling better. I feel better that solidarity um, across the continents. <laughs> well, you know how it is, man. We're all quarantined separately. Yeah, but uh, we had the governor of the Punjab and the chief minister of the Balochistan also say that, hey, man, you know, the virus lives in your uh, uh, throat for four days because apparently it's on board a transit visa. I don't know. And if you drink like, you know, hot water, it'll go down into your stomach. And then you had to have the advisor on health police be like, uh, no, not really. Don't do that at home. So but that's the only two times that's happened. Um, I do, however, feel and um, that the worst is is still to come. So um, that's that's very much a concern, Tamina. That's right. Absolutely. Um, I'll get into that a little bit further with Aisha in a bit. But Ross, first back to you. Now, what are your thoughts on the Jokowi media phenomenon and how it's faring so far through the Indonesian COVID-19 developments now that it really is crisis crunch mode? Well, this has certainly been um, a bad for his popularity. It's certainly been uh, shown that he has been slow to act and uh, the government broadly has been indecisive in um, making uh, quick and clear regulations around the country. Um, in many ways, Jokowi, uh, which people have well, been saying for quite some time, Jokowi is a populist uh, in his approach. He's described sometimes as a polite populist rather than the sort of Duterte or Trump type figure um, that you, you might come to think about when you're a populist. But um, the global uh, scenario has shown that populists are really handling this situation very poorly. Trump, of course, in the US, Erdogan in Turkey, um, uh, Duterte in the Philippines, Perhaps the exception is Modi, but that's a whole other, other story we could we could talk about. But in, in any case, Jokowi's mm -hmm. um, inability to take this seriously and follow expertise and serious health advice um, mirrors what we're seeing from populists globally. And the points that Aisha made earlier about his ineffective ministries joking about this or um, making um, bad recommendations is really all part of what is now seen as a as an increasingly unpopular government. And so in a recent survey uh, that I saw of social media sentiment, um, it was around 65% of sentiment was negative towards um, the President Jokowi and the government. 
Uh, and this then, of course, leads to other more decisive uh, local figures, local mayors um, or mayors of Jakarta, mayor of Bandung, who are looking more effective and more decisive, which we're sort of seeing in the US in a way uh, as well. Trump is worried about the popularities that, that local politicians uh, are getting by, by being decisive. And, and that's sort of uh, what's happening in, in Indonesia. Absolutely. Um, now, Aisha, moving back to you. So um, in recent days, roughly 900,000 people, almost a million from Greater Jakarta, the epicenter of COVID in Indonesia, have gradually left the city, traveled back to their hometowns, um, raising fears of the virus, of course, spreading to the provinces. Now, um, what do you feel ha will work with regards to keeping the population safe? And could you comment upon the recent phenomenon that's also been seen of Indonesian villagers using volunteers dressed as ghosts or hantu pochong in an entire shroud coming out at night? And that's actually been really effective in um, convincing people to stay indoors. Yes, yeah, it's funny you should mention that. Yes, um, in some towns in, in Java, people have been dressing up as, yeah, Pochong, which are uh, these ghostly figures that are, um, who weren't buried properly and who then escaped. Um, who've been, so people have been dressing up as them and then sort of like jumping out at people who are disobeying um, uh, kind of minor lockdowns. Um, I actually, it sounds funny, but I actually think that's probably going to be one of the more effective measures because there's a huge uh, amount of uh, superstition and belief in uh, things like Pochong here. So that may be a good tactic. It's, it, you know, in some ways you've got to feel for the government here because, you know, Indonesia has a population of what, 270 million people right. across 17,000 islands. You know, it's not easy to, uh, you know, a, a nationwide lockdown um, is difficult. It's a very communal society. So many people live in poverty and live day to day. They have to go out to work. Uh, you know, uh, fruit sellers and uh, you know tailors. All these people who um, you know can't work from home um, and who really you know uh, it would be a disaster for them to not work. So I mean, I think it's different. The government is in a difficult position in some ways. Um, but as um, Dr. Ross was saying, I mean, we are seeing uh, at a provincial and regional level people stepping up, like the mayor of uh, Tagal in central Java, who pretty early on said he was going to lock down the city for several months, um, even though Jakarta said he wasn't allowed to and they weren't going to do it. But that was actually quite an interesting case study in that he, he made that decision and was lauded for it, for, you know, kind of taking a strong line where Jokowi had failed. But unfortunately, what happened was several days after the lockdown was enacted, people just ignored it and people complained for some of the reasons that I just said, that they, you know, they have to go to work, mm. they can't stay at home. Um, and so the, the lockdown was then overturned. So, I mean, that's a very small example of, of the, the sort of, I want to say civil disobedience in the best way. It's not very easy in Indonesia to lock people down. That's right. And I do remember that the mayor of Tagal, when he announced the extended lockdown, he had said, I'd rather have my people hate me than have them die. But nevertheless, um, economic concerns, pressures yeah. uh, are what came to the forefront. Zarar, do you have a point? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add to something that Ross said sure. uh, regarding the United States. Um, we, we, we are having a similar phenomenon here. Um, look, the federal government, um, not to mince words, really fumbled the initial response. Uh, not horribly, thank God, but they didn't uh, take it seriously enough, quickly enough. And uh, we know that time is really of the essence in this entire thing, right? Now, in that sort of vacuum of leadership, the uh, uh, leadership of the province of Sindh, and then the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, they really stepped up and they started taking measures. So now, but you see, now we have, we're stuck between this debate. Like, for example, the Sindh provincial government, the argument is that, hey, you know, there's no point in talking about reviving the economy if people are dying. The federal government's point of view is that, no, I mean, we've got to kind of keep an eye on both. We have mm -hmm. to, like, protect against the virus, but we also have to allow certain businesses to open up. 
But um, again, as Asia was saying, I mean, I think we have a similar situation here. It's not easy to lock down a place like this. And it's not easy to lock down a people like this yeah. for any length of time. The controls start fraying. People start getting frustrated. Um, and if someone is hungry at home and not making any money, it's going to be very difficult for you to stop that person from coming out of the, uh, the house. Um, also, just to respond and, and also just to highlight one other thing that I've been following um, and I think people are increasingly following is, is the weaponization of the virus. Um, I mean, he mentioned, Ross just mentioned Modi. So uh, I do want to point out that, I mean, the Absolutely. merits of how he did the lockdown um, on one side. Um, I think the only place we are really seeing the virus weaponized against minority community is in India. Um, you are actually seeing media, mainstream media-led campaigns. I'm not even talking about social media here. Um, blaming the Muslim community for spreading the virus when, in fact, I mean, the facts are quite different. There are multiple vectors. That has real-world effects. You're seeing um, entire families being chased out of villages. You are seeing Muslim vendors being attacked. And this comes, um, I'll point out, uh, right in the aftermath of the Delhi pogroms in which uh, mobs Absolutely. largely supported by the state, largely supported by the state police actually burned down entire Muslim neighborhoods. So you are seeing the BJP and its allies um, continue with the same campaign that they've been waging, but using the virus as a weapon this time. I think that's incredibly disturbing. And I think that that is perhaps a uh, trailer to what you're going to see in other parts of the world. Take a look that in the United States, for example, the Hispanic and the black community, the Latino communities are being disproportionately affected. How long before the right starts to call it a Hispanic virus or a black virus, much like uh, Trump is calling it a Chinese virus? Um, what happens in Europe when the, uh, when the, uh, the virus spreads further, when the economic effects the virus come in. I mean, already there's that narrative of these guys are coming in and taking our jobs. What when there actually are no jobs? What happens to that narrative? So I think that in, in some ways, and it's very disturbing to see this, the virus is acting as an accelerant for the worst trends in uh, human society right now that were already existing, but now are going to um, accelerate. And I think the same goes for the um, underlying fascist tendencies of many populist governments. Um, this virus, I mean, Hungary is, is a brilliant example of that. I think that this virus is really going to lead to fascists and um, sort of radical movements accelerating their agendas. I love that you um, chipped in with that comment, Zarar. It is something that we see on perhaps a much smaller perspective, even in um, a country like Malaysia, where in the early days, um, calling it, um, uh, quote unquote, the Wuhan virus, et cetera, it's still something that you see in our social media cycles up till today, even though so much of work has gone into it, uh, into um, changing the narrative. But I think the most interesting point you made there was the fact that India, for example, mainstream news outlets are weaponizing COVID-19 news. Um, now, this is just a question for all of you, if there's a comment that you'd like to make on the fact that, for example, when we look towards America, where um, Fox News on one hand has definitely, as a mainstream media outlet, also been uh, purposely misrepresenting, spreading disinformation, misinformation. So how does that impact media realities in the post-COVID world? And also when you look towards um, regional media outlets in East Asia. I think I'll just uh, chip in first. I think uh, when, sure. we, when Zara was talking about weaponizing, uh, I, I think in, in Malaysia, because we just had a change in government, uh, the sentiment of uh, the public facing uh, the pandemic has been sort of like uh, weaponized uh, so that there should be no criticism against the government at all. So we have seen uh, our information mm -hmm. department coming up with guidelines on what they call as fake news, uh, which includes not criticizing the government. And I think this is uh, mm -hmm. dangerous because whatever it is uh, that the media is reporting that may be critical of how the government is uh handling the pandemic is instead being used as uh you know uh, it, the government can simply spin public 
sentiment into seeing it as attacking how the government is helping the public in trying um, you know to, to keep everyone healthy and I, and I think uh, this is a very uh, dangerous uh, precedent and which uh, would you know we, we don't know yet when this uh, pandemic uh, will end and so how much longer will uh, the government uh, acts as if we are in an emergency and in that way you know restricting uh, or targeting the media uh, with a very uh, you know very uh, it, it is becoming quite hostile in a way uh, with how they work with the media uh, and uh, you know is this a precursor towards you know a, a much longer uh, hostile relationship with the media or will we be able um, to report much free, uh, more freely uh, soon? Uh, we, we still don't know about that. And that uncertainty is uh, you know, quite worrying for me. That's right. Without fear or favor, there were also um, comments that were made by the NSC with regards to not, for example, in Malaysia, mm -hmm. uploading any um, so-called negative um, imagery or videos um, regarding the police who yes. have been, of course, in charge of ensuring that the movement control order or the lockdown, as it's called in Malaysia, is um, properly carried out. Now, this was actually in regards to the fact that there were um, a few cases of women who had reported being sexually harassed at um, checkpoints by the police. Now, when you have that coming out, of course, you've got civil society stepping in. So now I would like to move into a broader question. Uh, back to Aisha. Now, what, is, what has been the role of um, civil society in cooperation with uh, media organizations or media outlets or even journalists during the COVID-19 um, scenario, ensuring that some or at least some quality verified information still gets out to the general public? Well, we have some groups um, in Indonesia who do great work at uh, debunking uh, hoaxes. So there's one, for example, called Mafindo, which uh, works with local volunteers. I think we, I recently interviewed them. I think they have volunteers in 18 of, of Indonesia's 34 provinces who are debunking hoaxes as they come out. But it's a little bit like playing whack-a-mole because, you know, one will pop up and then, you know, they spread everywhere. So it's a pretty thankless uh, role in a way. Um, so there are groups that are doing that, but I think to go this and this sort of go back a little bit to your previous question about you know what's going to happen with this. Indonesia has a law which is called the UUITE law, which is the electronic transactions law. Um, and it, it's important to look at this law in this context because it was uh, signed into force by Indonesia's previous president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. And it kind of didn't really, it grew legs under Jokowi because when Jokowi was campaigning to be president, he was attacked so much online in a way that we kind of hadn't seen it being so vicious and so, um, and spreading so fast on social media. So they said things like he wasn't, so they, they said he was half Chinese, that he wasn't a real Muslim. They said that he was a communist. Um, they photoshopped pictures of him at communist rallies before he was even born. I mean, it was, it, it was, you know, it was kind of, it really was a lot at the time. And so what, but what happened with that is that Jokowi then, when he became president, kind of allowed this law to flourish and to be used more and more to clamp down on people who were critical of the government because it served him to do so because he had been attacked so much. And what we're seeing now is that, um, you know, at this time is that we're now seeing an uptick again in the UUITE law being used against people who are criticizing the government response to COVID-19. And then of course the worry with that is that first of all, you know, this is the time when we should be critical and we should be asking questions. And so it's absolutely the wrong time for that law to be used if there was ever a good time. But also it, it not only clamps down on information at the moment, but then when this ends, you know, it will, will, the worry is that, that lasts and we never sort of get back to kind of media freedom, that, that the clampdown that is happening now will continue. 
Yes, setting the tone. Uh, now, if you're just joining us, this is episode two of The Point with me, Tamina Kauzji. Today, we are discussing um, COVID-19, disinformation and media realities in East Asia with um, a stellar group of panelists. Um, continuing and moving on. Um, Ross, back to you now. Uh, now, regarding the Philippines, which also came in lowest, number 20 at the bottom of the rankings for a pandemic safety ranking recently uh, because of the inefficiency of government management. Now, what role do you feel in so far has been played by the media in Philippines to try and combat the tide of not just disinformation, but also um, overarching governance controlling it still? Yeah, and just a to related point to the previous discussion we were having about the future of the media in the post-COVID era. It's a bit, bit soon to be thinking sure. about the post-COVID era, but uh, it is interesting <laughs> to think about where we're heading. And um, I like the idea that there's going to be one, though. Let, let's hope there is a post-COVID era. And uh, but, but one of the concerns that um, we need to think about in the media landscape, particularly in Southeast Asia, but also in, in Australia and, and other countries, is is that as we head into a recession, undoubtedly, global recession, perhaps even a, a Great Depression similar style, that we're going to see um, advertising revenues um, being completely pulled out of uh, media companies, um, in particular local media companies. And um, so we, we may, we're presuming, and we're already seeing this in Australia, um, by the way, but we're presuming that a lot of media companies will actually have to fold. And so that is that is a concern for a lot of um, a lot of local news, but also uh, for quality journalism. And what will replace that? Well, in many ways, we're already starting to see that. The Philippines is a great example of this, where um, a lot of uh, the local news sites are now moving on social media, and there's community pages on Facebook. Um, there's uh, local um, Facebook groups that are sort of buy and sell type things, but they also share a lot of information in local communities. And so in many ways, there's still a demand for local news, as you would expect, but that has moved towards Facebook groups in Southeast Asia in particular. And a lot of these spaces are spaces which are easily manipulated or have indeed been created by local politicians or local political actor groups in order to then be used later for a political campaign. So the overall political economy of this is really important as we, as we think about the impact of, of COVID-19. Thank you, Ross. Uh, moving back into Zarar. Now, Zarar, um, even before the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic and this entire era, we've had um, heartbreaking conversations about the failure of the polio vaccination program in Pakistan previously already. Now, what are your thoughts about whether or not um, what's happening with COVID right now will possibly augur well or perhaps even worse, increasing fears around um, vaccination programs, particularly in Pakistan? Yeah, I mean, it's a real concern. That's a real concern. I mean, uh, granted that we, at this point in time, I don't think we have a reliable timeline on uh, when we may have a COVID vaccine, um, but certainly you will most likely see a similar um, arguments that have been uh, sort of leveraged against or used against the polio vaccination, used against the COVID vaccination. However, the difference is that um, COVID is the kind of disease that is um, immediately apparent, right? Uh, it's not like, oh my God, if I don't give my kid this polio uh, vaccine, he may develop point problems at some point in the future. This has a relatively shorter gestation period. So when you're seeing people around you dying um, painfully, gasping for every breath, um, it is entirely possible that people may change their minds about it. However, what is happening, um, and this is a concern and it's largely been underreported so far in Pakistan, largely because we have other priorities at the moment, is that uh, vaccination drives for polio and for measles and for other diseases are sort of falling by the wayside simply because the entire focus now is on COVID. And also because of the restrictions on movements, you know, and social distancing and so on and so forth, the vaccination teams aren't really getting out there either. So um, while we try um, uh, to tackle COVID, the real danger is that a lot of the endemic diseases 
are going to stay, stage a resurgence. So to me, that is a concern. Um, what is another concern also is that we don't know how the numbers are. Because the number of infected are a factor of the number of tests you've done. And we haven't really done that many tests. Uh, this, in fact, reminds me of what the health minister of Burundi said uh, recently. Um, there's no there's no single uh, coronavirus case in Burundi. And when they asked the minister how he achieved that miracle, he said, it's very simple. We don't have a single testing kit. And if we don't test, then, well, we have no positives, right? So we have limited tests. Uh, we have a limited capacity to conduct tests. And the only metric that I've been looking at so far is deaths. And just today, I had a story that, frankly speaking, terrified me. And that is about the number of people being uh, taken to hospitals, either dead or near death, with pneumonia-like symptoms. Now, these are people who were not tested for coronavirus. They may be dying of coronavirus, but we just don't know. And most of their um, survivors, their relatives, are reluctant to get um, autopsies done that would confirm coronavirus because then they feel that, oh, they will be put in isolation and they would be put in lockdown and they would be put in quarantine. So I strongly suspect that the number of cases we are reporting and the number of cases that actually exist, there's a vast, vast difference there. Mm, yes, brilli sir. yeah, brilliantly observed and, and very, very troubling as well, because even in Malaysia, insofar as we know, pneumonia like illnesses have not actually been included in the count for um, COVID-19 exactly. um, deaths. Now, um, drawing from that point though, um, this one's a question for all of you. Um, what are some actionable short-term as well as long-term approaches to ensuring that we move towards a scenario of increased media freedom in East Asia, especially in the post-COVID world to come? Um, we just have Aisha coming back in. Aisha, can you hear us? Aisha, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, the internet's not great no here problem. because That's everybody's okay. working from home <laughs> and also everyone's studying yeah, from home. So, and the no internet's problem. not great I'm in Medan anyway, anyway before okay. you even start. So. Yeah, so um, yeah. let me just uh, re uh, repeat what I was saying. So drawing from what Zarar was speaking about, the fact that looking at the post-COVID um, time, let's talk now about media freedom and what sort of actionable solutions for short-term as well as long-term um, institutional reforms and changes need to be seen in East Asia to ensure that media freedom goes on an uptick. It doesn't actually get, um, you know, scaled back or stepped upon or quashed? Well, I mean, that's really the million dollar question and I, one that's kind of very, very difficult to answer. Um, I think uh, Dr. Ross was right in saying that, you know, it, this is the moment to support local media. We need them more than ever. Uh, we need, especially at a time when many journalists are, um, you know, benched and not going out, for the ones that are going out or are able to go out, like me in places like Medan, we really need to support the media that, that has people on the ground that can tell us the full story. Um, but in terms of wider reform, I mean, it's easy to say what, what we would like to happen in somewhere like Indonesia, but I think, uh, I don't, if anything, as I said before to the previous question, I don't think we're moving in in, in any way towards reform. I think we're moving um, into potentially a, a more a trickier time with the news in Indonesia because I think the government will probably use this as an opportunity to um, say, look at all this this misinformation that we have, all this fake news, um, and to clamp down even more. I mean, I don't know, Dr. Ross, if you would agree with that in the context of Indonesia. Yeah, as you say, it's so hard to hard to know um, where we're heading into, and and certainly we are seeing crackdowns in the region on the media. Myanmar most recently looks a, a really uh, it's a really scary case of, of the way that the government is using the COVID nineteen scenario to um, to crack down on individual independent news. Uh, sites. So I guess the the only other point to to make, given that we're on burn, burn like talking with Bernama and uh, 
and um, is to, to think more broadly about the role of, of state broadcasting or public broadcasting uh, in each country. And that's something that you know, governments have really avoided for many years, including democratic governments in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, they've tended to use them, uh, and I'm not speaking specifically now, just broadly, that they've tended to use these um, state broadcasters as generally propaganda outlets to promote uh, the good news of the government, and that's that historically what their role has been. And um, it would be great if in this COVID-19 era, they can think about that, the importance of those organisations to produce reliable information, but also allow journalists and those organisations to have the freedom to comment on and critique the government where necessary, uh, including those ministers who might uh, say stupid things or sp spread misinformation. And that would give uh, citizens a, re a more reliable uh, government funded news source in the region. And so that's one of the things we're very lucky in, in Australia to have. The ABC has been um, a really important source of information for Australians throughout this past month or so. And, um, you know, without that, I don't think we would be able to have transitioned so effectively into a lockdown process. And, and that's something for governments to think about. But yeah, Zerari, I'd be interested in what you think. Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like Thank you for that, Dr. Ross. I was just going to key into <laughs> Zerari. Your thoughts, Zerari, of course, on the fact that with the government coup, what actually came to a halt amongst many other planned reforms and institutional changes was the setting up of an independent Malaysian media council. Yeah. Your thoughts on media freedom in Malaysia right now and for the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think if anything, the government and the public should realize by now that the importance of the need of uh, verified and accurate information coming from uh, reputable sources, uh, which means they would uh, perhaps see the importance of having uh, a flourishing and independent media. And not only that, but I think uh, this was something that was uh, to be fair, uh, quite lacking during the Pakatan Harapan government previously, which is uh, for the government to uh, work more with uh, the media. You know, uh, in, in you know, we are both stakeholders in trying to inform the public, um, and I think uh, not not just for the media, uh, for the government to just rely on the state uh, media, but also with all media outlets in trying to inform the public better about what the government is doing and also as uh, media as also uh, you know giving feedback on how the government is doing and I think that's very important because you know the, the government cannot just live in an echo chamber of just listening to their uh, advisors uh, and you know uh, seek offense uh, rather than critical feedback from the ground and I think uh, this is very much important uh, so in uh you know to, to sum it up i guess uh, i hope uh, there is also a, a bigger media literacy among the public you know before this people would just simply uh, forward text messages through whatsapp and other social media so i guess uh, it has been a very painful learning period over the past month or so about you know uh, mm -hmm. on how to verify uh, certain facts and you know then the responsibility on each and every uh, person to you know basically verify your information first rather than to just simply forward it yeah, so perhaps that could be something that uh, actionable that comes out of the entire COVID-19 um, scenario globally. Um, average citizens, we become a lot more um, actuated to fact checking, even personally. Uh, Zarar, I wanted to ask you at this point. Um, now, what about Pakistan? State broadcasters, uh, public broadcasters. What type of a role should they be playing? Are they playing the role that they need to right now? Uh, and what is your idea about the media freedom scenario in Pakistan? Yeah, they, 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 I don't think that they're playing the role they need to be playing. I think that, um, you know, when this new government came in, there was a lot of talk about, you know, oh, now the state broadcaster is going to be covering um, even the opposition parties, uh, you know, as much as it covers the government um, that lasted about, I don't know, about two weeks. And um, then it went back to business as usual. And um, I think you have a fair idea of what that is. I mean, just today you had the Sin chief minister giving a press conference and uh, the state broadcaster cut to a relatively minor member of the uh, ruling party, you know, sort of blasting the Sin chief minister. Um, unhelpful.
to say the least. Um, as far as me, I'm not. And um, things weren't really headed in a good direction to begin with. And now I think you're just going to have more of the same, but faster and and uh, more intense, so to speak. Um, uh, also, you have realized that, uh, you know, the kind of we haven't even yet been hit by the economic crisis that's coming. Um, things were tough as it was, as they were. And um, now when we're looking at a global recession, um, the, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 30s. Um, so you're going to see a further squeeze on the media as you're going to see a squeeze on just about every single other industry, which will, of course, uh, directly affect the media's uh, ability to resist pressure from the government. Because what forms does that pressure come in? It comes in the selective um, uh, avoiding of uh, government advertisements. Now, government advertisements should be awarded on the basis of circulation and um, ratings, right? But instead, we see that uh, they are awarded largely out of political preference, right? Um, this particular channel or media group is favorable to us, so we'll give them more money. This particular media channel or group is not, so we will deny them that. I mean, either you uh, um, award them even-handedly or you don't award them at all. Um, then there are, of course, other ways of doing it. Um, I mean, which will, I mean, I, that could that will take too long for me to actually, you know, sort of enumerate. But I think you have an idea of That's what right. that is. So um, I'm generally seeing um, things. I've always been seeing things moving in a darker direction. I just think you're going to get there a hell of a lot faster now, Demina. All right. Thank you, Zara. Now, we actually have um, two questions from the audience that's been tuning in as we've been talking. Let's bring in those questions before we wrap it all up nicely. So we have a question from um, Chan Tao Chu. Uh, any thoughts on whether the public will be more agreeable to government surveillance in the name of ensuring public health? This one's for any one of you. Just uh, let me know and go for it. Well, I, I think I think yes. I think in 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 many ways yes, because um, and I think that that's largely a factor of how bad it gets in um, in 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 whatever country that we're specifically talking about, and also what country's historical relationship with the state and with state surveillance has been. I think that even in democratic countries, you're going to see now. Um, a far greater tolerance for often intrusive surveillance. I mean, I think Italy, I don't think anybody's going to have a problem with that in Italy because they're looking at what, you know, thousands of people dying. So people are like, OK, I don't mind giving up a little bit of my privacy or a little bit of my freedom. In country that was happening anyway, like in China, I think you're going to see it scaled up to uh, hitherto unprecedented levels. Um, and I don't think you're going to have by and large too many complaints about it. In America, of course, you're the exact opposite. I mean, you're seeing people marching and be like, oh, my freedoms are under attack. Your freedom to do what, Karen? I mean, go down to Walmart with your shotgun. You know, really? Buy guns so, and toilet um, paper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're crazy. I'm sorry, but they're, they're like, I mean, totally bonkers. You know, I mean, with their anti-vaxxers and everything. I mean, at least we can make the argument that, oh, my God, these people are uneducated. What's their argument? I, I just don't get it. But now we're going off topic, so I'll just shush. <laughs> Thank you, Zarar. Um, any one of you also have something to comment on uh, Tacho's um, question? Yeah, that's been so, a big issue today in Australia with regard to um, the Singaporean uh, app that um, is being introduced where you, you get to choose whether you sign up to this app, which allows allows the app to track your movements and therefore the government can say who you've been cl in close contact with. Um, so it's uh, it's an emerging issue now for um, for Australia. I think that um, more, more broadly that the concern um, would be big companies like Google and Facebook who are saying, look, we're doing all these good things now with our data and citizens can say and countries can say, well, that's that's great. Help us out with that data. Um, and then they will in the post COVID era turn around and say, well, look, you know, we, we did it for good. And so now you've got to um, got to let us continue these uh, these um, uh, surveillance methods. Thank you for that, Dr. Ross. Right. Um, shall we move on to the next question then? This is from Putri Noraina Balkis, who's asking, how can media navigate through political sentiments online on their media reporting mm. better? 
um, as some netizens, as we call them in Malaysia here, really love to fire things up despite the reporting, meaning to deliver verified news to the public. Zurairi, perhaps? Oh, wow. This is a very... <laughs> it's it's hard thing to do, you know, because sometimes um, the public, they have uh, different perceptions on how media outlets, uh, you know, de de deliver the news. And sometimes they uh, they would like to think that there is a, you know, uh, insidious agenda behind choosing which angles or uh, what, what sort of reporting on certain people, you know. So it, it is very hard to escape whatever people perceive on how you write or present your stories. And I think uh, what is important is just to, you know, um, keep your report as accurate as possible. And, you know, sometimes it is important to have a context and background so people can understand. But I think the prop there, there's another problem here is that which is that mm. you know some people just do not read beyond the headline, and I think that is absolutely there is there is a exactly it's a danger the that we all have to uh, you know be mindful of, which is you know as much as in we 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 do try to be fair, uh, we we also sometimes do have to. Uh, you know, be aware of how we present certain issues, especially uh, issues that may be contentious in certain certain communities, and you know, be careful on how we word things. And uh, you know, sometimes when when we uh, you know do have to correct things, we we, we do that. But I think, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. I would love to hear what others have to say about this. Yeah. Anyone else? I just want to give a shout out to your uh, uh, followers because they're asking some seriously tough questions. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you you know, that, with, with me, it's usually like, so how much did you get paid to write this news? I hope you die. And th these guys are way cooler. I mean, I, I do. Like, I mean, I, it's, it's, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. All right. Thank you for that, Zerar. Um, anyone else mm. to key in with some thoughts on how can media navigate through political sentiments online on their media reporting better? Or we'll just move on into, I hear we've got one more question. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this one says... Well, I mean, okay, fine. Look, uh, I think, I think the, 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 the only thing you really can do is to try as much as possible to separate the news from the noise, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, it's, it's really easy. I mean, we shouldn't just be running after every political story like a hungry dog runs after a bone, right? I mean, I think that right now our priority is to report on the coronavirus pandemic itself. Um, what is being done to mitigate it, you know, and to say it as clearly as we can. And with the knowledge we have operating, um, you know, to the best of knowledge and within the limits of what is scientifically proven at this point in time. Um, that, that's, I think, I think our concern right now is to develop a degree of scientific literacy. Because uh, with, when you're dealing with something as, as, as technical as a viral pandemic, um, it's very important to get your facts correct. And when you don't know something to openly admit and say, okay, look, I'm saying this to the best of my knowledge, could be wrong, please also do your own homework. I mean, I, I think that's the best we can do under extremely, in extremely trying circumstances. Mm -hmm. Right. So drawing from that, I, I wanted to ask this. Perhaps it's very idealistic, particularly in these times, but just like the medical profession has a Hippocratic oath, do you believe... Or do you feel that there is the opportunity right now in the midst of what is hopefully a global shakedown and a change in collective consciousness? How about the media industry, journalists? How about a Hippocratic oath of sorts for us that not only puts our media organizations, yeah. but also media practitioners themselves in a position of always only having to report without fear or favor. I think it's great in theory, but it's never going to happen, right? Because How I mean, like, for example, happen? right? I mean, uh, I, mean, I mean, you're talking about like international solidarity and like here, if like, for example, I get shot, my rival channel will not even name my TV channel. <laughs> They'll just say, oh, the anchor of a local TV channel got shot. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Okay, that's that's uh, impossible to translate. But 
you know it's very poetic just take my word for it <laughs> it is it is and i do understand but uh speaking about something you get more it. practical you get it. more doable would um uh, media councils that are far more empowered in individual uh let's just talk about east asian countries would that work towards instituting uh media freedom as well as um the quality of news aisha I think Aisha's line is a I'm little sorry. bit sketchy. No problem. Yeah. Not very good. Sorry. Could you repeat the question? I didn't quite sure. hear it. No problem. So Aisha, I was asking uh, with regards to localized media freedom, the Indonesian uh, press council is fairly strong. What do you feel is its role during the COVID nineteen pandemic to also ensure that at least verified. media outlets are carrying the right information for the indonesian public well i don't think um necessarily at the moment that the indonesian media is doing a bad job of reporting the facts or that they are reporting themselves misinformation or disinformation but i think the problem uh one of the issues that we have with indonesian there's a real lack of um analysis or pushback so mm. you have situations like if we go right back to the start of the show that i was saying we've got people saying you know ministers saying well we won't um get sick because we're in the tropics or we won't get sick because we can just drink jamu or we can just keep praying you know the newspapers will carry that without debunking it at the same time so what we're seeing at the moment is sort of this kind of regurgitating what people mm -hmm. are saying uh without any kind of critical analysis behind it and so i think in indonesia that's what we're lacking at the moment it's not that papers are necessarily putting out yeah uh, anything that is that is you know patently untrue but it's this lack of pushback against some of the things that the authorities are saying you know and that's really you know the difference in some ways between just reporting what someone is saying and then journalism when you know you you have to push back um when people are saying things that are problematic i mean and president jokowi uh, at the start of the um covid outbreak in indonesia because we indonesia got to it relatively late on the 2nd of march said and this is a direct quote we deliberately uh withheld information to avoid creating mass panic which is a terrible terrible quote i mean that the, the the government withheld information is something that really should not have been allowed to to go on question and yet it kind of just it came out as a quote and then we moved on so we i think in indonesia that's what the media needs to focus on right thank you for that aisha definitely a point to be made that that has to be analysis together with journalism now we have one last question after which we'll wrap this all up and this last question is for all of you let's bring that in um why religious institutions seem to be impervious to the logic of being under lockdown and they seem to have their own media amplification channels i.e. social media across the board whichever country you look at that dispute the mainstream medical academic and even government narrative so why are religious institutions seemingly impervious to the logic of covid-19 lockdowns and you know examples that you've seen in your own could, if i could go first on that but... yeah if i could go first on that because this is actually a time when indonesia has kind of gone against the grain because right. um in the, even though the government has resisted a lockdown it actually fell to the mui which is the uh, muslim ulama council which is the largest uh, muslim non-governmental uh, muslim body in indonesia actually said uh came out with a fatwa to say actually no and they quoted parts of the hadith that if there is a plague in your country you do not go out and uh, if there is a plague somewhere else you do not go in so which is from the hadith to say that actually people should stay inside and should also not go home for eat so it it in in a very strange uh, order of events in indonesia it actually fell to uh 
a, a religious organization to actually go against the government in favor of a lockdown. So I don't know if that's the same in Malaysia and in Pakistan, but it's a very interesting one for us here. Well, that's great. That's actually, that's great to hear. Um, we've had a lot of people quoting the same ahadith. And, uh, you know, in fact, I mean, there are uh, actual guidelines and uh, rules uh, in the hadith and in fact in the Quran for how to deal with a pandemic situation. And they are essentially, I mean, social isolation, quarantine, so on and so forth. Absolutely. So we have had that being quoted. Um, I wish we had had the same situation as you had in Indonesia, because here we have seen, um, and look, there's a difference now. I'm going to draw a distinction between actual clerics who have actually studied the situation mm -hmm. and the phenomenon that we have here in Pakistan of what I like to call merchants of faith. For these people, uh, religion is really a business, you know, and um, anything that affects that business, that affects the bottom line and they react very violently. Um, Again, that's a phenomenon that, uh, as you're aware, you're seeing in the United States as well. You're seeing uh, to some extent in India, you're seeing everywhere in the world. Um, unfortunately, those are the voices that get amplified. And um, those are the voices that find a larger audience. Because if people were to actually study what the religion says about how to deal with these circumstances, they will know that these people are absolutely on the wrong side of it. So they're not here um, from a religious point of view. They're here from a business point of view. Um, for them, their mosques are their places of business and mm -hmm. anything that affects that, that affects their profit margins and their bottom line, they will attack. That's right. Dr. Ross, any perspectives on this? Well, the, the only thing might be to add is is around Mudik and, and the organizations like Enu, um, which of course, Jokowi and Prime, uh, Deputy, uh, Vice President Maruf Amin, of course, part of Anu, and they haven't explicitly banned Mudik in Indonesia, which really I think probably the Indonesian government and Jokowi would have been happy if they did because then that means that he's not the anti-Islamic guy who's banning it. Um, and, in fact, it would have come from those organisations like Anu. But it seems that they didn't want to attract the wrath of their followers by banning the most anticipated holiday of the year. Um, and uh, so in, in many ways, um, this, this, this indecisiveness um, can be blamed also on some of Indonesia's largest um, um, Muslim organisations. Thank you. Um, Zurairi, any comments on that? Yeah, I think in Malaysia, as far as institutionalized uh, religions go, um, the, the the Islamic bodies has not actually been going against the grain in, in, the, in this matter. I mean, because they have been very um, helpful. I mean, th there's a lot has, that has been said about how the uh, tabligh uh, followers in uh, Malaysia has largely been responsible for the biggest cluster of COVID-19. But I think by and large, they have been very, very cooperative with the government. And I think they do not deserve uh, the That's hate right. and the discrimination that, uh, you know, the public has uh, thrown against them. And I think for, for the most part, um, the main uh, Islamic uh, NGOs and also the authorities uh, have been very cooperative and, and has further, um, you know, uh, the government narrative on this uh, effort. Uh, the problem is this uh, is with you know uh, independent and also fringe scholars at, at the site, uh, which uh, you know uh, gives away all these conspiracy conspiracy theories and you know uh, and bad advice. Um, it, the only thing that I may nitpick on how our uh, response uh, towards this issue uh, sure. on the side of religion has been, uh, you know, is is that. The, the health ministry has not been given uh, the decision-making power when it comes to this sort of um, decisions uh, regarding religion. For example, I, I think we uh, delayed a bit when it comes to banning uh, Friday prayers. Uh, I think we uh, the minister in charge of religious affairs, uh, or, uh, you know, only... Uh, uh, announced that you know Friday prayers and all congregational prayers are not al allowed. Probably like probably like one or two weeks uh, later than what it should have been, and uh, this is because um, the the health minister uh, or the health ministry itself was not the point man when it comes to deciding on this type of policies. But instead, it only ha it only has the uh, authority to 
uh, suggest uh, these sorts of uh, policies to other ministries rather than actually deciding on these sort of matters. And I think when it comes to a public health uh, crisis, you know, the Ministry of Health should be more empowered. It should have more say on uh, public policies, and 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 it should not be overruled by any other, uh, uh, you know, ministries. And, and what more uh, when it comes to religious affairs? Right. Thank you so much for that, all of you. Now, we've got two more questions, but I'm just going to um, have them displayed as food for thought more than anything. And then we're just going to round this up. You've all been wonderful in so far, uh, despite slightly unstable internet connections here and there. Um, this one, I'll just read it out. What is the core issue and reason that fake news keeps getting more prominent? Do we have to rely on authorities to tell us what is news and what is not? It's a confusing cycle to grasp. So that's one. And another one, how do we ensure, let's pop that back in, how do we ensure that governments will always act in the public interest if the critical press is labeled as fake news? Uh, Asian countries are too comfortable with strong arm governments. <laughs> All right, so there you have it. So a couple of... Lots of food for the. I, I literally think we could go well into <laughs> another quarter yeah. of an hour with all of this. But you've all been wonderful. Thank you so much Easily. for joining us here on The Point today. Dr. Ross, Aisha, Zurairi, and Zarar. You've all been wonderful. Please yeah, stay on. We'll been. actually uh, have you in the background for a little bit um, just to um, debrief you and wrap it all up. Uh, but I'll just finish off my um, outro for the show before I get back to you in the broadcast studio. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Aisha. Right. So there you have it. That was episode two of The Point with me, Tavina Kausji. Today, of course, we focused on COVID-19, disinformation, and media realities in East Asia with panelists from Pakistan, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, as well as Dr. Ross Tapsell, an academician author joining us from Sydney, Australia. Now, of course, to beat the COVID-19 pandemic, the global community, governments, as well as media practitioners need to spread evidence-based awareness. But at the same time, governments in East Asia, in particular, continue clamping down and restricting media freedom. So these make it very worrying precedents indeed. So remember, any restrictions on media freedom often precede the erosion of other fundamental rights. And not just in East Asia, but the entire world will need all these rights fully actualized to successfully recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to end with one of my favorite um, Stephen Hawking quotes, um, because I think it's absolutely apropos to the topic at hand. Stephen Hawking said, um, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. Thank you for watching The Point with Tamina Kausji. Till next time, stay safe, stay home, and stay informed. I'll see you again next time.